when it comes to interpreting things like Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 talks about Gog, the chief prince. Well, that's a principality. That's not a human. That's not a man. That's a, a god with a little g. That's a spirit. And he's got an army, a mighty army. And all of them come in riding on what? Horses. Now, there's three ways of doing this. When you see that passage, you can either say, as do a lot of people, well, Ezekiel, there were no such things as tanks and Humvees and Jeeps and vehicles and airplanes back in the day of Ezekiel, and that's just old archaic language. And it doesn't mean what it says. Now, I don't believe that. I haven't believed that in a long time. Or you can say, that's already been fulfilled. That's why it says they were holding spears and shooting bows and arrows and riding on horses. Because that's already been fulfilled. I don't believe that either. So what does that leave me with? That leaves me with the idea that there is an army that's going to come. The likes of which we have never seen. And it's an army that literally is riding on horses, but not horses from down here. And they're not tanks from down here. They're of the spiritual realm or the spirit world. You can say the fourth dimension, the spirit world, or whatever, however you want to make it out to be, but that's what they are. And they really are using swords, but they're not using earthly swords of earthly steel. This is from an entirely different realm or world that this invasion is coming to this earth now if that blows your stack and you can't handle that I'm sorry but what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to with scripture make that case that outside of this world there exists another realm where there are creatures there are angels, there are spirits, and they have a form. They're not just they're not just floating balls of gas. We know their nature, in other words. They have a nature about them. Even though spiritual beasts have intelligence hence the word daemon or demon demon means an intelligence like an intelligent type of supernatural creature all right even though they have intelligence they still have a nature a character about them You see what I'm saying? They have places that they like to dwell in. Isaiah 34 tells us that. Isaiah 34, 9, The streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, oil, and dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever from generation to generation. It shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Now, what he's talking about is God's going to he's going to take this area, he's going to destroy it, raining fire down from heaven so that no man will ever dwell there ever again. Now what you've done is you've set up a situation and a place where since man does not dwell there, creatures will naturally go to that place. For always point you to the spiritual world. Always, 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 and always. Always does. Um, 
flesh of man, flesh of beasts, flesh of fishes, and another of birds. Now, take that very idea. In fact, let me, let, let's give it to you like this. In Ezekiel 1, when, when Ezekiel sees the four cherubs that are the chariot of God, because they have wheels in them, and above them is the seat, the throne where God sits on. That's his chariot. How many faces do these four creatures have? Four faces. One is like a man. Another is like a lion. Another is like an ox. These are four-footed creatures. Another one's like an eagle. That's a fowl of the air. There's one missing. Well, I won't say there's one missing, but the Bible then speaks of another type of spiritual creature, and that is those who at least part-time or full-time dwell in water. Uh, let's see here. Th verse 14, again, Isaiah 34. Thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles, and brambles in the fortresses thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. Uh, I, I got to move on. I keep wanting to chase these owls and wild rabbits everywhere but the wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island and the satyr shall cry to his fellow and screech owl also shall rest there and find her place herself a place of rest there shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow there shall the vultures also be gathered every one with her mate i i gotta read the very next verse i got to do that because it gives you the remedy if you have an infestation of these creatures. There's a remedy. The remedy is in verse 16 where it says, let me, let me go there. You see that there shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, everyone with her mate. The remedy to this is seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mouth, or her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded and his spirit it hath gathered them. The remedy to get rid of these doleful creatures is to seek out the book of the Lord and read it. Somebody say amen. That's the remedy to get rid of of this infestation that you have. So, do I believe in haunted houses? Yes. Do I believe that people are visited by, I'm going to use the word alien, because I think the Bible uses the word alien in reference to these creatures because in Hebrews 11 they fought off the armies of the aliens bom, 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 bom. do I believe in haunted houses haunted graveyards that to me that, to me that's easy the, the man that had the legion of devils, where did he live? He lived in the tombs, in the catacombs. Why? Because that's where those spirits, see, they love dead things. In other words, we know from Genesis 9 that God put in these beasts' heart a fear of man. Well... As far as earthly beasts goes, that's true. Earthly beasts fear earthly man. Spirit beasts don't. They're not afraid of you. You're, you're food to them. You're nothing to them. But they are afraid of one particular man. That would be Jesus Christ. So, contemplate this now. Some of you listening to me have an infestation of creatures 
and you can't get rid of them. Because I'll tell you what's happened is you created a place where they like to live. You create you did that. What if what if well let me ask you this question. What happens when an animal in the woods dies? They're, wherever they die, their body falls. And there are creatures in the forest, in the woods, that are looking for that opportunity to eat that carcass. There's scripture here. That Because that's what they do. Remember what Jesus said? Where the, where the carcasses are, That's where the what will be gathered? The eagles. And was he just referring to earth eagles? No. Because I have a list of scriptures that I believe shows us that there are spirits in the shape of eagles and thus have the eagle nature about them. So let's look at their dwelling places. Um, We set up in Isaiah 34, verse 9, the fact that this is a place where no man lives. Nobody's living there. No human's living there. So what moves in? Verse 11. Count this out loud with me. The cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. One, two, three, four. Now think about it. Cormorants and bitterns or terns eat fish. They eat flesh. Uh, And they don't even scale it. They don't even pull the guts out of it. They just eat the whole thing. Owls and ravens also eat flesh. In fact, ravens, they don't mind eating rotten flesh. Owls like to kill their food. Ravens, eh, whatever's laying there dead, they'll eat it. So you have four types of what? Creatures with wings. Angelic species, angelic creatures, a species of spirit beings that have wings like owls and bitterns and eagles and ravens. All right. Uh, Verse 12, they shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but but none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing. In other words, there's no people living there. And thorns shall come up in her palaces. Now, here's something else. Not only do I believe that we have or there exists species of spirit beasts, But I would say also that there are species of spirit plants. Paul said there was given to him a thorn in the flesh. And then what he, how did he describe it? A messenger of Satan to buffet me. A messenger. That's the word angelos in Greek, angel. Angels are messengers. And then you study, you take that, you take that one thing, thorn or thorns and thistles, briars, and study that through the scriptures. Your head will blow off, figuratively speaking. I would never teach you anything literally that would cause your head to explode. But you take that then and, and follow that through the Bible, see, see what... And then when you get to the cross and find out that they made a crown out of thorns. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> anyway, back to where they live. And thorns and thistles and weeds Well, at least in our country, we mow our grass. 
and we pull weeds out of our flower beds. Why? Because they don't belong there. We don't like it. They're ugly, and so we take them out. When a man is present, he takes care of the place that he lives in. And weeds just don't grow up everywhere. And and creatures don't move into our house. And if we find a mouse in there, we're gonna my wife is gonna make me do whatever it takes to get that mouse. If my wife sees one roach in the house, we have an infestation. That's an automatic infestation. And she's not going to let it go until I have sprayed the whole house for bugs, bugs and roaches. Kill them. They don't belong where we live. But when we leave, they automatically move in. And that's the point. I've made this for years. I've tried to teach you this. Jesus is the man. They are afraid of him. When he's present, they won't be present. When he's gone, they'll move in automatically. This is why the Bible issue is the important, the important issue to deal with. When it comes to a church or a church that you attend or a church that you call home or a church that you are a member of or a church that you're pastoring, if the word of God, Jesus Christ, the Bible is not present in that church, there is going to be an infestation of all kinds of creatures. Spoilers. That's what they are. They're spoilers. Because they do nothing for your house but consume it. They'll move in. Uh... We had, we had termites because I had a wood pile and I stacked it up against the house. Dumb idea. The wood pile drew termites. The termites then went from the wood pile into the lumber of the house. Ate up the lumber that out of our back door. Ate it up. Had to, get, had to call in a guy to get rid of them. That's my point. Where the man is, where Jesus Christ is, where the word of God is, these creatures will not and cannot infest. They might try, but all you got to do is get out a little can of King James and spray it everywhere and they'll leave. Somebody say amen. Turn to um, turn to Joel, chapter three. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Joel, chapter three. Joel is all about Joel's army. Right before Amos, Joel, chapter three. Uh, let's see here. Where is it? It talks about the northern army. I probably should use the Pure Bible Search software. Uh, but study things that come out of the north. 
okay, would be just a, a good study for you because God says this army, this northern army, he gives a very detailed description of it, albeit you're going to have to look in uh, various places. Yeah, Joel 2, yeah, Joel 2, 20, uh, Joel chapter 3, like I'm really smart. Joel chapter 2, verse 20, God said, but I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward, see, that's, that's what he's saying here, with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he has done great things. So we know, we know beyond any shadow of a doubt that Joel's army is the one that comes up out of the pit in Revelation 9. Sure, one uh, individual monarch out of uh, Fort Bragg uh, came in and said that they had um, uh, missing time and abduction and began to tell me about stories of uh, Area 51 and down in the basement and human-animal hybrids and all kinds of stuff and watchers there. So we got into uh, discussing it and they had, in advance to that, remote viewed my house and told me so and said they got this ability maybe from the, you know, you'll hear they'll, they'll get it from the aliens or whatever too. So I ask, I begin to ask the questions and just listen, listen more and listen more. And um, they said it first began with a sense of curiosity, and then they read, then there was like an energy, they felt energy. And uh, that even right now they're saying, I feel energy. And I said, well, let's, let's just do this, let's test this. So in the name of the Lord Jesus, we command whatever this energy, you know, whatever this is, because I already felt I knew what it was, uh, you can't go anywhere. Just simply ordering, you can't go anywhere, make yourself known. This person responded saying, and they had their eyes closed, they said, man, it's a, it's a beautiful translucent spirit. I've seen, I've seen it out in the, you know, the ether, the military remote viewers call that, because they remote view aliens and so forth too and have contact that way. And um, so we commanded this thing to say its name. It was really weird. It responded and said his name was Argon. Um, so the individual still believed that maybe this was like an alien spirit or a presence, a translucent, you know, spirit, you know, presence that that really helped take them further out and advance their human, uh, enhance their human capacities and so forth. So we finally commanded. Just simply, I said, "Well, let's do this," because they didn't want to give that up. They didn't want to give the energy or the power of that up. So I said, "Let's let's do something else." And before I even said it, they said, um, Argon is mad at you and because you contained him. And he's cussing at you right now. And I said, well, let's see what occurs. So we just commanded, again, ordered in the name of Jesus, Argon, tell this person. You know Jesus Christ is right here in the midst. Tell this person right now, what is your ultimate intent? Show them what you are. The person's face was completely aghast what they saw. And then Argon screamed out, the voice screamed out, to take them to blankety-blank hell, which they used all the verbal words. No different than any other, you know, demon that we've dealt with out of a Satanist. No different when unmasked. And then the person said, get it out. You know, and so we said, we just commanded Argon and anything else that we needed to deal with to get out. Um, the interesting thing was, they could no longer remote view. And... Um, I, I teraz e, oczywiście w momencie, kiedy demon jest tak przy, przy człowieku, to on tego człowieka wiąże ze sobą. Da? Czyli później może łatwo wrócić. I teraz wracając od tego, e, od, tej, od tej nauki egzorcystów, wracając z powrotem e, do scientologii, no to już na tym poziomie e, psychologicznym no tam jest taki, taki, taka procedura, że kładą człowieka na kozetce, prawdopodobnie go hipnotyzują, ale oni twierdzą, że, że tam jest cały czas taka formuła, że my Ciebie nie hipnotyzujemy, będziesz wiedział wszystko, co jest mówione po wyjściu z tego pokoju, będziesz to pamiętał, 
jeżeli pojawiłby się nawet przez przypadek jakiś rozkaz podczas tego seansu, to ten rozkaz ma być anulowany, ma nie mieć wpływu. Prawda? Czyli od razu jakby na sam początek mówią, nie, nie, my nie hipnotyzujemy. Co by wskazywało, że jednak elementy hipnozy tam są. I Hubbard mówi tak, w pewnym momencie y, natrafiamy na demony. I wy sami w pewnym momencie natrafiacie w sobie na demony. Zaczynacie czuć obecność demona. Czyli oni jakby przestrzegają, oni wiedzą, że przed tym tego się nie da ukryć, że człowiek będzie to czuł, że jakiś zły duch w nim jest, prawda? Że, że coś tu się dzieje nie tak. I tu się zaczyna cała teoria, prawda? że te demony to nie myśmy wprowadzili, tylko one was były. A poprzez to, że jesteście przez nas uzdrawiani, to dopiero je wykrywacie. Po drugie, te demony to nie są żadne demony, to jest co prawda to samo, co wypędzają egzorcyści. I to samo, o czym mówi nauka katolicka, bo to jest prosto powiedziane przez Kabarda, ale to katolicy się mylą, bo im się wydaje, że to są osoby, że to są jakieś złe duchy, że to są upadli aniołowie. Nie, to są tylko obwody elektryczne, które my tak odbieramy, że no coś się tam w mózgu psuje i jest obwód naokoło i ten obwód jakby gorzej funkcjonuje i to jest właśnie demo. Let's look at Joel now. I mean, this is what we do. We're, we started out in Jeremiah. We saw out of the north there cometh up a nation against her. And so what is this nation that comes out of the north? Joel 2:20 says it's the northern army. So let's find out a little bit about this northern army. So we go to Joel chapter 1. Look at verse 4. That which, verse 4. In fact, let's, let's look at patterns here. There are patterns in the Bible. Look in verse 3. Tell, tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. How many generations hear this story? Four. Then look at verse 4. That which the palmer worm has left at the locust eaten. Think of the locust of Revelation 9. That which the locust hath eaten hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. The fact that uh, some of the most um, extreme um, episodes are associated with these so-called reptilians fascinated me because they look like they're, they're grotesque kinds of frogs. And I couldn't, uh, couldn't resist the, the, the linkage between the, the frogs and the scripture here, the unclean spirits like frogs. Because in both cases you're talking about demons. Clearly what's going on in the UFO area is demonic and that's a whole other area. But uh, these, are demon these are obviously demonic. They are the spirits of devils, working miracles. See, we're not ready to... We, we, we can't imagine these evil things doing miracles. Why? Because the restrainer is restraining them. The restrainer is removed when the rapture happens. Think of four... Thi this is... This tells you... This number tells you that this is a spiritual army an army of spirits not just regular old worms spirit worms spirit locusts spirit devourers in other words and what we see in Revelation 9 is not Apache attack helicopters 
like Hal Lindsey said, they're not helicopters, they're not hippies, they are devils that come up, they are beasts that God, a, an army of evil So he mentions here the fowls of the in verse 4. And then when he gives the definition of what these fowls are, he's telling you they're spirits. Anything, anything with wings in the Bible is going to be indicative of an angelic being. In Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10, these cherubs have wings. We know, we know the dragon has them because he is referred to as the flying fiery serpent. The uh, the early Mexicans, who was it? The Aztecs. They had a they had a name for that. Called it Quetzalcoatl. The feathered serpent. The fiery flying serpent is who Quetzalcoatl was. Quetzalcoatl was an alien god to the Aztecs. He was a god to them that did not come from their land of nativity. He comes from a different realm. He is of another species, another nation. Different type of body. And what you see here in um, Daniel 7, these living creatures, these beasts, want, this was a lion, had eagle's wings, this is a leopard that had four wings like the beast of a fowl and also had four heads. He's telling you that they're from the fourth dimension, for fourth direction, the spiritual realm. Then we have the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. And he's not like any of the other beasts that came before him. He was diverse from them, different, different nature, different character. The fourth kingdom. Since we're dealing with the fourth dimension, where does the fourth kingdom come from? Where does it originate? Does it come out of the European Union? Does it come out of the revived Roman Empire? No. The Bible didn't say anything about that. What it's telling you is that this fourth kingdom comes from the land of principalities and powers and the land of the rulers of the darkness of this world and the spiritual wickedness in high places. That's your fourth kingdom. And that's where these celestial life forms are from. And you're also getting now a clue as to what their goal is. What is their agenda? What is the alien? And again, I'm using the word alien as described and defined by the Bible. 
What is the alien agenda? Alien agenda is what the fourth kingdom is determined to do on this earth. Look, here's part of it right here. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Do you remember what God said about the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman? He told the serpent, the seed of the woman shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt what? Bruise his heel. Same word here. The iron kingdom breaks in pieces, subdues, conquers. Is there an... I mean, let's not, let's not try to rely upon science fiction stories and um, National Enquirer articles and, you know, History Channel hyped up television series. Let's not rely on that. Let's think Bible. And according to the Bible, there is an alien agenda. An agenda, celestial life forms, their agenda is to subdue and conquer the entire earth. Now we can bring in uh, science fiction movies. Okay, The Day the Earth Stood Still, V, the TV series. Other, other movies where the aliens come down and they're going to take over the world. Independence Day. You see, we don't, we don't get our ideas from the movies and from science fiction. We get them from the Bible and then we turn around and look. They made a movie about that. Anyway, the Bible specifically says that he, he's horses and these chariots and he asks what they are and the angel says these are spirits so the bible is telling you what these things are they are life forms that are alien to this world they are not from this and men have been either seeing these in visions or seeing them with their eyes and drawing them and now our our enlightened educated minds look back at that and say well that's just the the fanciful imaginations of those these ancient cults i don't think so look here artwork there's a ship here there's one here here's moses in the ten commandments and you see these here see that for some reason, this wheel within a wheel is shining a light down through this wall and into this room. I have no idea what that, what that could be. Here's my favorite. Here's a painting of the Virgin Mary. And in the background is a brightly illuminated flying disc wheel-shaped object. And this guy here is looking at it. Where did that come from? Men have been seeing these things for years, what is the explanation for them? They are chariots. A nation, the Bible describes as an alien race that God is going to send as a form of judgment upon this earth. There is going to, listen, I'm going to say it like this is going to be an alien invasion. There, I said it. 
Do I really believe that? Yes. What I know is what the Bible says, and I take it very, very serious. Deuteronomy 28, 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth. See the, see the phrase, as swift as the eagle flieth? What, what does that denote? According to the Bible, these are spirits. A nation from far, from the end of the earth, as swift by the nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. A nation of fierce countenance all over, all over the world. Why? Tend to them a fierce countenance. There are spirits that God has given them a fierce countenance, and that's what this nation is. This nation, believe it or not, whether I use the language of these are, these are evil spirits, these are devils, and God's going to release them on this earth to do very hideous. If I say it that way, you might, you might receive it better. But if I say these are fourth dimensional alien life forms that will come with their chariots and conquer the earth, then I'm a weirdo. But essentially, that's what it is. We're talking about we're talking about the fourth kingdom and how God is going to send them to this earth to conquer over this earth. Yes. There is going to be an alien invasion and it will not be pretty. In verse 12, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, now the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world that, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. It's the reptilians that are going to gather everybody in the earth to the valley of Megiddo, Armageddon, to fight Jesus. It's the reptilians that do that. These devils, these spirits, were in the shape of fro frogs. What did God invade Egypt with? Frogs.
what's going to happen. Wyraźnie, najbardziej w trzecią tajemnicę fatimską uwierzyła masoneria Isa. Najbardziej w tym sensie, że oni zrobili wszystko, żeby ona się wypełniła i żeby ją przyspieszyć od tej złej strony. Od tej złej strony. Prawda? I, I widać tutaj współdziałanie, prawda? Że, 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 że masoneria jakby zrobiła wszystko, żeby napędzić ten islam do Europy na rok 2017, bo dla nich to jest ten rok. że w momencie, kiedy pojawiła się, kiedy została, została ujawniona wizja, czyli to, co nazwano trzecią tajemnicą fatimską, od razu w Islamie nastąpił ostry ruch, bo oni uznali, że po pierwsze w 1917 roku w Fatimie objawiła się Fatima, a nie Matka Boża, czyli córka Mahometa, prorokini islamu. A katolicy to wszystko sfałszowali. I te wszystkie gadki katolików to są kłamstwa. Drugie, z wizji wynika jakby oczywista rzecz dla islamu, tak? Przyjdzie, Fatima się pojawi na niebie, przyjdzie anioł z mieczem, wypali Stany Zjednoczonej Europy, Fatima zatrzyma ogień, żeby nie wypalił świata islamu. W tym momencie armia islamska objawi się w Europie, oni od razu rozpoznali siebie pod tym krzyżem, tak? To znaczy, co tam miało nastąpić pod tym krzyżem? Znaczy, idzie ktoś, kto niby jest papieżem, ale nie wiadomo, czy jest papieżem, prawda? bo y, on, y, znaczy, albo został wybrany niezgodnie z procedurami, albo jest antypapieżem, albo jest heretykiem, albo jest w ogóle antychrystem. No i, I idzie po to, żeby się zbratać z tym islamem pod tym krzyżem, i jakby na, albo się dogadać, że, że nie ma między nami żadnych różnic, albo się w ogóle stopić w jedną religię, idzie i widzi zwłoki tych ludzi, za których się modli i to nie są ofiary Men, męczennicy, bo za męczenników się nie modlimy, prawda, męczennicy, znaczy możemy się prosić męczenników, żeby za nas się modlili, prawda, bo to są już święci, więc to są ofiary jakiegoś kataklizmu, i jak on idzie na to spotkanie, to yy, idzie sam, prawda? I ci za nim, ci wszyscy yy, hierarchowie i ci świecy idą z własnej woli. Yy, i, I przeżywa jakąś przemianę po drodze, jakąś rozpacz, jakąś, yy, jakieś wyrzuty sumienia. Yy, znaczy to jest ciekawe, że, że wizja opisuje stan jego, jego wewnętrzny stan. Prawda? I yy, i, i dochodzi do krzyża i nagle klęka, nie? I ci żołnierze dostają szał, prawda? Bo miało być co innego zupełnie, prawda? I oni w tym szale go zabijają. No i ci pozostali jakby powtarzają, prawda? Czyli ci ludzie, którzy tam zginęli, umierają jako męczennicy. Znaczy przyszli się dogadać, a umierają jako męczennicy. Znaczy akcja się jakby w ostatnim momencie zmieniła, ale islam i tak dla niego to jest obojętne, co się stało ze strony katolickiej. Oni widzą jedno. Wymordowali tam cały Watykan. Stany Zjednoczone, Europa spłonęły w znacznej mierze, znaczy zostały osłabione przynajmniej. I przychodzi Mahdi. Mahdi to jest taki ktoś w islamie bardzo ważny, kto przyjdzie na koniec czasu z łukiem. I jak wystrzelone zostaną wszystkie strzały, to on już będzie samym łukiem bez strzału, bo zapanuje pokój na świecie, bo już nie będzie nikogo.
Ratzinger to w tej swojej opinii teologicznej wyraźnie mówi, prawda? Po pierwsze, to jest symboliczne, więc to jest kwestia interpretacji. I przychodzi Mahdi. Mahdi to jest taki ktoś w islamie bardzo ważny, kto przyjdzie na koniec czasu z łukiem i jak wystrzelone zostaną wszystkie strzały, to on już będzie samym łukiem bez strzału, bo zapanuje pokój na świecie, bo już nie będzie nikogo. We need to understand this is spiritual warfare. Satan hates who? Well, Satan hates all believers. But there's a certain group that he hates more, the one that's connected with Israel. The one that understands that they're spiritually Israel, and especially Jews in Israel, Israelis, that believe that Yeshua is the Messiah and are preaching the truth. This is making the dragon enraged. This is what Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 is speaking about. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua. Now, of course, the word commandments there is an inaccurate translation. It is the word Torah. Torah is God's instruction. So it should be saying who keep the Torah of God and have the testimony of Yeshua, it says. So it's very important to realize that the dragon is in rage and there's never been a generation closer to the coming of Yeshua HaMashiach than this generation. The gospel is being preached in Israel. Souls are being saved and the Orthodox movement is scared. If Yeshua was not the Messiah, they wouldn't go to all this trouble to persecute us and to threaten us. This is not the first time that Rabbi Weinberg and other rabbis connected with Yad Lachim, the anti-missionary organization in Israel, founded to deprogram believers, has attacked us. We as believers in Yeshua, are asking you as a family, as the one new man, to stand with us in prayer for the salvation of Rabbi Weinberg and other rabbis in Israel and other Jews who are scared of the truth. <laughs> ימשיכו לעשות את זה, הם יעוררו תגובות שהם לא מדמיינים לעצמם. אין סוף לעונש של מי שמטה, מי שמסית ומדיח. עונשו של כל אחד ואחד, כמו שאותו יימח שמו, אותו אחד מייסד הנצרות, אותו אחד מה שקורה איתו למעלה, עכשיו מאוד הגמרא דליטי מוזל, מאוד שם הגמרא, דנים אותו בצואה רותחת. חבילה של צואה. של פסולת שיוצאת מהקיבה של בני אדם וחתולים וכלבים וערלות ונמרים רותחת מבעבעת שם שמים אותו, שם הוא נענש כרגון רגע ורגע זה חבל, את זה לא הבאתם, אה? כל הכנסיות, כל הצלבים שלהם הצלב הגדול הזה על הארון בברזיל מתפוצץ לבסיסים לכל העולם, וכולם יראו את זה כולם יראו את זה ולהוציא את השקר של כולם החוצה, את השקר של הנצרות הזאת החוצה, שבשם כביכול בורא עולם, בשם כביכול יש לו כתפיים מרחבות, הוא לוקח את העוונות של כולם, של כולם, את העוונות של כולם, הוא ייקח, שום דבר, כולכם תהיו נקיים, כולכם תבואו לשתף שם בנדל. איזה שטויות, כמה דאר בן אדם יכול להיות, כמה סתום בלום, כמה... דביל ומפגר, אין מילים בעבירות, בן אדם יכול להיות בשביל להאמין לשטות המפגרת. As you can see in the video, Rabbi Weinberg is very, very upset, but you also can see that he knows that Yeshua died on the cross for our sins and rose after three days because he's mentioning the gospel. He knows the gospel. He's heard the gospel. 
So we're just praying that one day God will visit him in dreams and visions, and we're having many of these rabbis come to faith. So the fact that the dragon is in rage is because many Jews are being saved, the gospel is going back to Jerusalem, and we thank uh, you brothers and sisters for standing with us and being a part of the revival here in Israel. Uh, it's very important that we stand firm to the end, that we don't be ashamed of the gospel, that we're not afraid of persecution. This is what Revelation is speaking about, Revelation 14, 12. This calls for patience and endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commandments, who keep his Torah and remain faithful to Yeshua. So we will not stop until the end. We're gonna run the race to the end, become a victorious bride and stand together as the one new man. Please continue to stand with us in prayer for these Jews and other Jews that are really scared of the truth as the veil is being lifted. I'm Messianic Rabbi Zef Porat, sending you blessings from Israel in the name of Yeshua. Shalom. Partner with us at Messiah of Israel Ministries, sharing the love of Yeshua in Israel, for we are not ashamed of the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach. Hallelujah. Jeszcze może gdzieś to ktoś zapisze historię, że była grupa ludzi, która w roku 2018, w stulecie niepodległości, nadal upierała się przy tym, żeby osadzić fundamenty państwa na prawie naturalnym. Ponieważ my jesteśmy naprawdę bardzo niedaleko już jako Europa, jako świat, od tego momentu, że rządów nie będzie Rząd nie będzie potrzebny, ponieważ rząd wypełni swoją rolę. Te tak... Istnieje coś takiego, to jest termin, który chodzi, już pracuje w polityce. Obywatelstwo korporacyjne. I problem polega na tym, bo o tym mówią ci ideolodzy. Ja tutaj już u Państwa mówiłam o Żaku Atali, ale to nie jest tylko Żak Atali. Żak Atali to jest taka szara eminencja, już wspominałam. To jest pierwszy dyrektor Europejskiego Banku Rozwoju szara eminencja w ogóle tych elit politycznych, światowych. I on wprost mówił o transferze władzy od rządów do korporacji. A w momencie, kiedy mamy konstrukty nomarciksistowskie, to mamy człowieka zmielonego na tak zwanego gender, w związku z czym wtedy jest małżeństwo dla wszystkich, a aborcja, eutanazja, Ponieważ, proszę Państwa, jak nie ma Boga, nie ma człowieka. I teraz, dlaczego mówię, nie wolno w prosty sposób porównywać pantofelka, nawet jeżeli to robią wybitne umysły, do człowieka. Ponieważ człowiek jest obrazem Boga. I nawet jeżeli my się światu poglądowo nie zgadzamy, to proszę Pana, ja będę trwała na tej, w tej pozycji, ponieważ uważam, że człowiek jest powołany do wieczności, i ma się w ciągu tego życia doskonalić i temu mają służyć, przepraszam, zaraz skończę, wszystkie struktury państwa ma temu służyć edukacja. I wszystko teraz jest przeplancowane na ten sztuczny grunt. I teraz my możemy mówić o sztucznej inteligencji, tak, że, tak, tak, tym się też zajmują, tym się też zajmują, dlatego że ta ideologia, która zasadza się na fałszywej antropologii, na pracy wielu, bardzo wielu umysłów, wyśmienitych umysłów. Ja ostatnio przygotowywałam, to pójdzie w naszym dzienniku, ale jeszcze nie wiem kiedy, o Lewi Sztrosie. Kolejny pan, który yy, w ogóle nie liczy się z faktami. I jego biograf wprost o tym pisze, prawda? Czyli jesteśmy na gruncie yy, 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 ideologii, która jest tworzona przez ludzi świetnie opłacanych, którzy nawet podczas III Rzeszy Niemieckiej, panowania III Rzeszy Niemieckiej, potrafią się dostać do Ameryki. Tam dostaną świetną posadę, będąc Żydem, tak jak Lewi Strauss. Wój był, był, był rabinem. To nie chodzi o to. Chodzi o to, żebyśmy my sobie uświadomili, 
że istnieją ludzie w historii XX wieku, ja już streszczam się do XX wieku, jak Levi Strauss, prawda? Jak Rorty, jak Fromm. E, e, no, można ich wymieniać, którzy po prostu budują e, na uniwersytetach fałszywy obraz rzeczywistości, czy Mirsa Aliade. Święty Andrzej Bobola chce być naszym patronem. I ja się zastanawiałam, dlaczego. Dlatego, że problem Polski nie jest tylko problemem Polski, bo sprawa obywatelstwa korporacyjnego dotyczy już świata. To nie jest tylko Polska. To, to się rozlało. I zastanawiałam się, dlaczego święty Andrzej Bobola chce być patronem Polski. Upominał się o to. I y, oglądałam programy z jego, y, y, o nim i jego nazywano y, y, takim poławiaczem dusz. Duszochwatem. Duszochwatem. I do mnie dotarło, że tak na dobrą sprawę y, on woła o to, żebyśmy my wzajemnie ratowali swoje dusze. Bo my mówimy y, o różnych tam rzeczach, a sytuacja jest taka, o której mówiła święta siostra Faustyna i inni widzący, że ludzie masowo wpadają do piekła. Dlatego, że te systemy są ustawiane tak, że ludzie nie mają sensu życia, że ludzie tracą nadzieję. I to jest powszechne w całej Europie, to nie jest tylko w Polsce. Here it is, right here. Now, this image is the meditation room in the United Nations building in New York, New York. The meditation room designed by Dag Hammarskjöld, one of, not the, I don't think he was the first Secretary General, but he was one of the more prominent gen Secretary Generals of the United Nations from the 50s into the 60s. This big this big thing sitting in the floor here, big, huge, big chunk of square stuff sitting in the, you're supposed to go in and sit on the bench and gaze upon this monolith and this mural. You're supposed to you're supposed to gaze upon it. You're supposed to meditate on it or what? I don't know what you're supposed to get out of it. But let me, let me tell you what this is and what it means. Number one, you got to, the room was designed to be a pyramid. No matter what, the idea is, is that the serpent is what brings us eternal life and not Jesus Christ. Stop and think about what the serpent said in Genesis chapter 3. Ye shall not surely die. For God does know, in the day ye eat thereof, then you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And I submit to you that this world is on course to receiving something from the serpent himself. The name of the organization that has responsibility over this meditation room is called Lucis Trust. Lucis. L-U-C-I-S, not L-O-O-S-E-S, -E or L-O-S-E-S, -E loses. Lucis Trust. The former name of Lucis Trust was the Lucifer Publishing Company. Not making that up either. That is the truth. It was the, it was Madame Blavatsky's. The big block. What is it? Well, Manly Hall mentioned that lodestone of power that exists in all of us living creatures. When he mentioned that word lodestone, I remembered this. That that block, that monolith, that everybody goes and worships, that everyone bows before, everyone meditates on, this religious symbol here, veiled in secrecy and shrouded in mystery, is a 6.5 ton lodestone. Lodestone is, a, there's another name for it called magnetite. Because lodestone, magnetite, it was discovered that magnetite or lodestone can be used to point to 
magnetic north. That's what compasses have in them. Magnetic compasses have a piece of lodestone in them that always, get this now, get the symbolism of it. It always points toward and leads you toward the north. It's a piece of iron, it's iron ore. Think about the kingdom that that represents. Daniel chapter 2. And the fourth kingdom is the kingdom of iron. Let me tell you something. You want to get, you want to get down to the nitty gritty of the United Nations? The United Nations, its whole objective is to draw this world and put it under the submission of very, very evil angels. The fourth kingdom is principalities. It's the ones we're fighting against right now. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. The United Nations is a high place. Not only is it it's probably a big, tall building, but it also is a place where the world's leaders, the most powerful people in the entire world, show up at the United Nations building. And the spirits of the fourth kingdom are there in that building with those people. They are literally doing spiritual wickedness in high places. The fourth kingdom, since we're dealing with the fourth dimension, where does the fourth kingdom come from? Where does it originate? Does it come out of the European Union? Does it come out of the revived Roman Empire? No, the Bible didn't say anything about that. What it's telling you is that this fourth kingdom comes from the land of principalities and powers and the land of the rulers of the darkness of this world and the spiritual wickedness in high places. That's your fourth kingdom. And that's where these celestial life forms are from. And you're also getting now a clue as to what their goal is. What is their agenda? What is the alien, and again, I'm using the word alien as described and defined by the Bible. What is the alien agenda? Alien agenda is what the fourth kingdom is determined to do on this earth. Look, here's part of it right here. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Do you remember what God said about the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman? He told the serpent, the seed of the woman shall bruise thy head, and thou out what? Bruise his his heel. Same word here. The iron kingdom breaks in pieces, subdues, conquers. Is there an, I mean, let's not, let's not try to rely upon science fiction stories and um, National Enquirer articles and, you know, History Channel hyped up 
television series. Let's not rely on that. Let's think Bible. And according to the Bible, there is an alien agenda. An agenda. Celestial life forms. Their agenda is to subdue and conquer the entire earth. Now we can bring in uh, science fiction movies. Okay. The Day the Earth Stood Still. V, the TV series. Other, other movies where the aliens come down and they're going to take over the world. Independence Day. You see, we don't, we don't get our ideas from the movies and from science fiction. We get them from the Bible and then we turn around and look. They made a movie about that. Anyway, the Bible specifically says that he sees horses and these chariots and he asks what they are and the angel says, these are spirits. So the Bible is telling you what these things are. They are life forms that are alien to this world. They are not from this world. And men have been either seeing these in visions or seeing them with their eyes and drawing them. And now our, our enlightened, educated minds look back at that and say, well, that's just the, the fanciful imaginations of those, these ancient cults. I don't think so. Look here. Artwork. There's a ship here. There's one here. Here's Moses in the Ten Commandments. And you see these here? See that? For some reason, this wheel within a wheel is shining a light down through this wall and into this room. I have no idea what that, what that could be. Here's my favorite. Here's a painting of the Virgin Mary. And in the background is a brightly illuminated flying disc wheel shaped object. And this guy here is looking at it. Where did that come from? Men have been seeing these things for years what is the explanation for them they are chariots a nation the bible describes as an alien race that god is going to send as a form of judgment upon this earth there is going to listen i'm going to say it like this is going to be an alien invasion there i said it do i really believe that yes what i know is what the bible says and i take it very very serious deuteronomy 28 49 the lord shall bring a nation against thee from far from the end of the earth as swift as the eagle flieth see the see the phrase as swift as the eagle flieth what, what does that denote? According to the Bible, these are spirits. A nation from far, from the end of the earth, as swift by the nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. A nation of fierce countenance all over, all over the world. Why? into them a fierce countenance there are spirits that God has given them a fierce countenance and that's what this nation is this nation believe it or not whether I use the language of 
These are, these are evil spirits. These are devils. And God's going to release them on this earth to do very hideous. If I say it that way, you might, you might receive it better. But if I say these are fourth dimensional alien life forms that will come with their chariots and conquer the earth, then I'm a weirdo. But essentially, that's what it is. We're talking about we're talking about the fourth kingdom and how God is going to send them to this earth to conquer over this earth. Yes. There is going to be an alien invasion and it will not be pretty. In verse 12, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, now the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world that, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. It's the reptilians that are going to gather everybody in the earth to the valley of Megiddo, Armageddon, to fight Jesus. It's the reptilians that do that. These devils, these spirits, were in the shape of fro frogs. What did God invade Egypt with? Frogs.
What's going to happen? Something wonderful. What? I understand how you feel. You see, it's all very clear to me now. The whole thing. It's wonderful. What's going to happen? Wyraźnie, mnie, najbardziej w trzecią tajemnicę fatimską uwierzyła masoneria Isla. Najbardziej w tym sensie, że oni zrobili wszystko, żeby ona się wypełniła i żeby ją przyspieszyć od tej złej strony. Od tej złej strony. Prawda? I, I widać tutaj współdziałanie, prawda? Że, 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 że masoneria jakby zrobiła wszystko, żeby napędzić ten islam do Europy na rok 2017, bo dla nich to jest ten rok. że w momencie, kiedy pojawiła się, kiedy została, została ujawniona wizja, czyli to, co nazwano trzecią tajemnicą fatimską, od razu w islamie nastąpił ostry ruch, bo oni uznali, że po pierwsze w 1917 roku w Fatimie objawiła się Fatima, a nie Matka Boża, czyli córka Mahometa, prorokini islamu, a katolicy to wszystko sfałszowali i te wszystkie gadki katolików to są kłamstwa. Drugie, z wizji wynika jakby oczywista rzecz dla islamu. Prawda? Przyjdzie, Fatima się pojawi na niebie, przyjdzie anioł z mieczem, wypali Stany Zjednoczonej Europy, Fatima zatrzyma ogień, żeby nie wypalił świata islamu. W tym momencie armia islamska objawi się w Europie. Oni od razu rozpoznali siebie pod tym krzyżem. Da, to znaczy, co tam miało nastąpić pod tym krzyżem? Znaczy, idzie ktoś, kto niby jest papieżem, ale nie wiadomo, czy jest papieżem. Da, bo y, on, y, znaczy, albo został wybrany niezgodnie z procedurami, albo jest antypapieżem, albo jest heretykiem, albo jest w ogóle antychrystem. Da, I idzie po to, żeby się zbratać z tym islamem pod tym krzyżem, i jakby na, albo się dogadać, że, że nie ma między nami żadnych różnic, albo się w ogóle stopić w jedną religię. Idzie i widzi zwłoki tych ludzi, za których się modli. I to nie są ofiary Men, męczennicy, bo za męczenników się nie modlimy, prawda? Męczennicy, znaczy możemy się prosić męczenników, żeby za nas się modlili, prawda? Bo to są już święci. Więc to są ofiary jakiegoś kataklizmu. I jak on idzie na to spotkanie, to yy, idzie sam, prawda? i ci za nim, ci wszyscy yy, hierarchowie i ci świecy idą z własnej woli. Yy, i, I przeżywa jakąś przemianę po drodze, jakąś rozpacz, jakąś, yy, jakieś wyrzuty sumienia. Yy, znaczy to jest ciekawe, że, że wizja opisuje stan jego, jego wewnętrzny stan. Prawda? I, yy, i dochodzi do krzyża i nagle klęka, nie? I ci żołnierze dostają szału, prawda? Bo miało być co innego zupełnie, prawda? I oni w tym szale go zabijają, no i ci pozostali jakby powtarzają, prawda? Czyli ci ludzie, którzy tam zginęli, umierają jako męczennicy. Znaczy przyszli się dogadać, a umierają jako męczennicy. Znaczy akcja się jakby w ostatnim momencie zmieniła, ale islam i tak dla niego to jest obojętne co się stało ze strony katolickiej. Oni widzą jedno. Wymordowali tam cały Watykan. Stany Zjednoczone, Europa spłonęły w znacznej mierze, znaczy zostały osłabione przynajmniej. I przychodzi Mahdi. Mahdi to jest taki ktoś w islamie bardzo ważny, kto przyjdzie na koniec czasu z łukiem. I jak wystrzelone zostaną wszystkie strzały, to on już będzie samym łukiem bez strzał, bo zapanuje pokój na świecie, bo już nie będzie nikogo.
bo Ratzinger to w tej swojej opinii teologicznej wyraźnie mówi, prawda? Po pierwsze, to jest symboliczne, więc to jest kwestia interpretacji. I przychodzi Mahdi. Mahdi to jest taki ktoś w islamie bardzo ważny, kto przyjdzie na koniec czasu z łukiem i jak wystrzelone zostaną wszystkie strzały, to on już będzie samym łukiem bez strzału, bo zapanuje pokój na świecie, bo już nie będzie nikogo. We need to understand this is spiritual warfare. Satan hates who? Well, Satan hates all believers. But there's a certain group that he hates more, the one that's connected with Israel. The one that understands that they're spiritually Israel, and especially Jews in Israel, Israelis, that believe that Yeshua is the Messiah and are preaching the truth. This is making the dragon enraged. This is what Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 is speaking about. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua. Now, of course, the word commandments there is an inaccurate translation. It is the word Torah. Torah is God's instruction. So it should be saying who keep the Torah of God and have the testimony of Yeshua, it says. So it's very important to realize that the dragon is in rage and there's never been a generation closer to the coming of Yeshua HaMashiach than this generation. The gospel is being preached in Israel. Souls are being saved. And the Orthodox movement is scared. If Yeshua was not the Messiah, they wouldn't go to all this trouble to persecute us and to threaten us. This is not the first time that Rabbi Weinberg and other rabbis connected with Yad Lachim, the anti-missionary organization in Israel, founded to deprogram believers, has attacked us. We as believers in Yeshua, are asking you as a family, as the one new man, to stand with us in prayer for the salvation of Rabbi Weinberg and other rabbis in Israel and other Jews who are scared of the truth. <laughs> של פסולת שיוצאת הכיפה של בני אדם וחתולים וכלבים וערלות ונמרים רותחת מבעבד שם שמים אותו שם הוא נענש לרתו רגע ורגע זה ככה וזה לא עובד, מה? כל הכנסיות, כל הצלבים שלהם הצלב הגדול הזה על הארון בברזיל מתפוצץ לבסיסים לכל העולם וכולם יראו את זה כולם יראו את זה as you can see in the video, Rabbi Weinberg is very, very upset, but you also can see that he knows that Yeshua died on the cross for our sins and rose after three days because he's mentioning the gospel. He knows the gospel. He's heard the gospel. 
So we're just praying that one day God will visit him in dreams and visions, and we're having many of these rabbis come to faith. So the fact that the dragon is in rage is because many Jews are being saved, the gospel is going back to Jerusalem, and we thank uh, you, brothers and sisters, for standing with us and being a part of the revival here in Israel. Uh, it's very important that we stand firm to the end, that we don't be ashamed of the gospel, that we're not afraid of persecution. This is what Revelation is speaking about, Revelation 14, 12. This calls for patience and endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commandments, who keep his Torah and remain faithful to Yeshua. So we will not stop until the end. We're going to run the race to the end, become a victorious bride and stand together as the one new man. Please continue to stand with us in prayer for these Jews and other Jews that are really scared of the truth as the veil is being lifted. I'm Messianic Rabbi Zef Porat, sending you blessings from Israel in the name of Yeshua. Niech tylko jakiś mój kapłan diecezji powie, że przeciwko imigrantom od razu go suspensuje. To nieprawdopodobna metoda. A jak ukochany biskupie, zaczną nas islamici wyżynać. Gdzie ty będziesz? Poddasz się do dymisji władzy? Wycofasz się? Będziesz miał honor bronić Polski? Jedź na Podole, jedź na Woły, zobacz tam mi Dziesiątki tysięcy grobów, którzy bronili Rzeczpospolitej przed Islamem. Bitwa z samochodami, problem imigracyjny, to jest jedno wielkie kłamstwo. Mam przedstawiciela z Wiednia u siebie. 1100 euro dają na jedno duże miesięcznie. Aby te pieniądze wysłać tam do ich kraju, gdzie za tą, za tą przebitkę wybudujesz dom, logicznie pomyśl pan Jasiu. Nasze 100 zł w Afryce znaczy 50 zł. Bo jest taki przeskok technologiczny, ekonomiczny, rozumiecie? Jest to jedno kłamstwo. Biednemu światu może Europa niesłychanie pomóc. Bez wprowadzenia ich tu. Tylko nie chcą, bo wiedzą, ku czemu prowadzi ta droga i mają przygotowany przycisk aby rozpocząć ostatnią rozprawę z chrześcijaństwem w Europie i katolicyzmem.
there's a lot of evidence that there's physical danger associated with messing around or dabbling with aliens. Okay, with that much said, I mean, there's a lot more I could say about this. As you probably know, I could talk about this all day long. Um, I'll just end it with, with basic, basically saying that I do think that uh, I know who the aliens are, and I think they're associated with the realm of the demonic. And past centuries, I think people knew this to a certain degree, because UFOs are nothing new and aliens are nothing new. It's just they called them by different names in different centuries, right? Fairies and gnomes, things of that nature. They were always identified with demons. They even had the Incubi and Succubi that were, that were destructive demons, okay, in the Middle Ages and beyond, that would even get involved with, with, with sexual experiments with people and things of that nature. The problem is today is that we think they're all good. They're still little men in most cases, and but now they claim to be coming out of flying saucers. And so I'm not here as a preacher to try to win you over and getting saved and things of that nature, although that would be good if you did, but that's not my purpose. I do want you to think through the implications of UFOs and realize that the theology from the UFO movement is diametrically opposed to the Bible, and I do think that they are absolutely demonic. Okay? There's a demonic element to little green men or aliens and through contacts and things of that nature. And we know that because the message is diametrically opposed to God's word, the Bible. And the way they'll lead you is away from Christ. And I think on the basis of that, we can conclude that they, it's a non-Christian, excuse me, non-Christian religious system. Okay.